Today, I'm going to talk about geodesign applications in ecology using Yellowstone as a template for characterizing resilient and healthy ecosystems. I'm an ecologist with a background in systems approaches. 17 years ago, I co founded a nonprofit based in Montana called Yellowstone Ecological Research Center, where I served as senior research scientist, VP, and program manager. The Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, about 20 million acres in extent, is a mosaic of public and private lands. In the center, you can see the park itself. It's about 60 by 60 miles in extent, a postage stamp, really, on the face of the earth. In Yellowstone, we have an ecosystem whose structures, protected undeveloped landscapes, components, that is species, and processes, for example, migration, predation, and hydrological regimes are among the most intact remaining in the temperate world. The ferocious wild of my title refers to the fact that all 18 species of terrestrial carnivores originally endemic to the park are still present. One of the few places in the lower 48 where you can still see a wolf, a mountain lion, a grizzly bear roaming freely. Given this happy conjunction of ecological integrity and legal protection, Yellowstone offers itself as a benchmark or standard of reference for the healthy, well-normal ecosystem. Using Yellowstone as a model, the idea is to build a library, a set of reference standards for healthy, functional ecosystems. The larger idea is to develop methodology and workflows for establishing reference values to characterize healthy ecosystems in general. Over the last six years, I've worked on a joint NASA-US Fish and Wildlife Service project developing tools, workflows, and imagery to build holistic ecosystem models. If any of you are interested in the more technical aspects of this project, find me later. But for now, in a general sense, when I use the term benchmark ecosystem, what I'm getting at is this, a systems approach to reference standards. Of course, all this begs the question, what constitutes health? Take a look at the two people in the image. Are they healthy? How would we know? What are the markers that we use? Then take a look at the setting. A lake looks alpine, water looks clear, air looks clean, landscape appears undeveloped. That's often a kind of shorthand for ecosystem health. There are a lot of implicit assumptions we make based on outward appearances. But we know intellectually that appearances provide insufficient information about vulnerability, about resilience, about long-term health prospects. The look is not the metric. The look can't be the metric of health. When we deal with ecosystems, we're left without adequate metrics. So what do we do? It strikes me that the most reasonable way that we can all approach ecosystem issues is to borrow from public health paradigms where it's established practice to operationally define health by both function and range of values. Think of your blood panel when you go to the doctor. How do you know you're sick? You've deviated measurably and directionally from a standard of published, validated, well-normal conditions. These aren't political. These are reference standards. There's a library of ranges of values for almost all aspects of individual and population health. Think of infant mortality rates, influenza infection rates, your white blood cell count, your serum cholesterol. We're all quite comfortable with this system of metrics. Why not apply the same principles to ecosystem health metrics? We sort of do through the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, but that's as far as we've gotten. My work? is about creating and supporting the library of well-normal values for intact ecosystems. This approach moves the arguments about health and resilience into the empirical data-driven domain. We remove the frame of contentious philosophy and move ahead with rationality, informed by a long-term vision of systems persistence. Ecology has historically been confused about its ability to deliver a clear outcomes-driven message. Let's contrast this with the thought system as it exists in the practice of medicine. In medicine, a code of bioethics informs all activities, whether you're a basic scientist, a bench researcher, a clinician, a family physician. All practitioners share an outcomes-driven 
common code. In ecology, we experience a continuous recalibration of what we accept as minimal ecological integrity when we don't have reference standards or guiding code of bioethics to go back to. But we can do better. Here's a workflow for the ecological benchmarking effort I've been working on, supported in part by a NASA ecological forecasting grant to integrate remotely sensed data, organismic data, and geophysical data. We use geodesign principles throughout in workflows and thought process, and in framing applications and approaches to complex ecological data integration. The fundamental workflow in all cases is as shown. So we begin with species and or habitat data. These are available either present day or retrospective. We add in from the huge armamentarium of available climate inputs, both retrospective and prospective. Yellowstone is one of the most intensively imaged areas uh, globally, both because it's of interest ecologically and also because it serves as an analog for remote theaters of interest, highly dissected mountainous terrain, low population densities, um, low road densities. So LIDAR, small footprint LIDAR, hyperspectral, um, radar, aerial photography, you name it, and there's a number of group shoots as well. These first three inputs are then fed into existing, already validated, well-proven ecological model structures, and from those we can take out support for management and decisions. This work focuses on animal populations because animals are aggregators of ecosystem condition information. The better the habitat quality, the more the animal community organization will be stable, functional, and persistent. Our modeling approaches make use of this information aggregation. We focus on animal densities as a highly efficient shorthand for ecological integrity. The converse is, of course, also true. Absence of animal populations shows us that a piece of the system is missing or out of the range of sustainable values. I'm going to quickly show you some work from a systems model in Yellowstone. What you're looking at on the left are the building blocks of a holistic ecological model, spatially specific data arrayed in layer stacks. Think of these as maps of attributes of interest. On the left side of the image, we begin with a USGS quad orienting you to the region of interest. Below that, there's a small mammal biomass layer, basically how many grams of small mammal per square meter. Think of small mammals as the krill of the terrestrial landscape. Uh, critically essential for the food web. Below that, a remotely sensed derived uh, vegetation layer, and elevation is, as you all know, critically important for um, prediction of response to changes in climatic regimes. Moving um, across the image, there's the little box called data integration. For those of you who live in the GIS world, that box can also be called blood, sweat, tears, and teeth gnashing, right? That's uh, a lot happens in there, so that's the, about 90% of the work in assembling these bottles occurs in that component. And then we move across to the right-hand side of the model, which is the layer stack array. And uh, let's see. So we can see the same data layers connected by a punch through, that purple rod, moving all, through all the data layers. The intersection of this punch through with each of the data layers yields a value from the point of intersection, and these are subsequently fed into tabular arrays, spreadsheets, for um, the follow through into the modeling component of the workflow. Um, obviously, these purple punch throughs are arrayed across the landscape, and they can be developed according to different sampling regimes, uh, randomly, or at different sampling intensities. So the peel of this layer stack and then punch through approaches threefold. It's absolutely simple. It's scalable up or down on several levels. And lastly, it's amenable to scenario building or what if models, as we'll see in a moment. So let's um, just take a look at the right hand side of this image in an expanded view. Same punch through here is shown in red, so it's a little bit more visible for you guys. On um, the layer stack of the data are fed, um, the data intersection values are fed into a tiny fragment of a table that you can see up there as a representative grab. And then again, these go into the models. So you all remember the concept of the 
well normal ranges of values for a healthy ecosystem that we began with. This table can be immediately mined for high and low values across the region of interest. So we have a bankable range of values for each of the attribute layers, as well as a wealth of relational information and distributional information. For scenario building, data layers for anticipated futures, such as proposed developments like new roads can be input, and the resulting forecast models can be compared to existing models. We hold all inputs constant, save one, rerun the model. So this is a really controlled, rigorous, and transparent way of forecasting. The bottom layer in the layer stack is the model output itself. In this case, it's a probability surface for an antelope habitat model. And you'll see it again in the next image. If there's any modelers out there, it's a resource selection probability function map. And so here we see the modeled output. Um, the colored image at the top right represents about 1,500 square miles of Yellowstone's northern range. You can see the USGS quad that orients you to this piece of landscape peeking out from underneath the same scale color ramp modeled surface. Red line running through the center is a road. Um, and as far as the color ramped image itself, this image answers a question, where is it great to be an antelope? With brown representing prime habitat and blue representing um, less used or less um, desirable habitat. So the color ramp surface here is arrived at by using equations that relate all environmental layers to each other. Then we fit the best model from the arsenal of current published ecological model structures. The table to the left side of the image depicts that part of the quantitative model results. I figure this is a black hole of post-lunch slump. We can leave that part out, right? Um, so let's take a quick look at the lower right corner of this color ramped image where I've thrown in a yellow box and we'll run a scenario. Here we see that grab of our original model surface. I have run a road through there in tan, it's evident, encircled in yellow so you can see it. Um, it's clear that that road runs through what we remember as prime antelope habitat in dark brown. So remember for this process we hold all model inputs constant save the one and then we rerun the model. And we can see in the bottom image this uh, rerun output. The total coverage of brown pixels by visual inspection is decreased and the road effect is also more pronounced at the convergence of the two roads. So here we have a quantifiable, transparent, and defensible forecast model. Remember that animals are information aggregators. They tell us directly about ecosystem quality. So we build models around animals and their continued population presence. It's the most efficient way to understand ecosystem integrity. Animals provide the fundamental controls on the systems they inhabit. Our dominant cultural narrative portrays animals as decorations on the landscape. But recent research shows us how integral they are to knitting together the fabric of the systems we rely on. Yellowstone is the planet's first national park, protected in perpetuity, not just 250 years, perpetuity. Um, that's a bold concept Roosevelt came up with. Her legacy has inspired the creation of parks and protected areas throughout the world. With all the components and processes still in place, she and the data that she embodies can be used as a standard of reference for system health, the world's first benchmark ecosystem. In conclusion, I agree with Brand Farron's assertion that the stories we tell about the world we live in matter greatly. I believe in the power of narrative models and of visual and graphic imagery. These have the power to shift how we humans relate to the world. I think we can begin to write a story that's large enough to encompass a bioethical set of arguments. The story I'd like to write is the story of a data arc, A-R-K, in which to place our knowledge of the healthiest of what remains as we as so that when we design our way forward, we still maintain the blueprints of the elements that we have not yet become wise enough to understand, let alone replicate. So I hope you take away three ideas. First, without a standard of reference, our conservation efforts will necessarily be incomplete. Let's benchmark our conservation efforts using state-of-the-art data. Second, animals are brilliant aggregators of information about ecosystem condition. We can use their presence 
to inform us on how we're doing in supporting Earth's systems. And lastly, a complex effort like this needs a superstructure, a powerful yet transparent architecture, and geodesign can serve that function.